locate. Oh, Emma Barakay, how are you, mate? I'm fine. I am. So, thank you. Are amazing. Thank you for sparing the time. Oh no, I really wanted to participate in this, largely because it's my own format. But you know, um, so I can probably bring something that would be valuable to the conversation. Oh, mate, a huge amount. And in terms of Maori research and Maori researchers, this is a profoundly useful model for oh, our yeah, Indigenous too. colleagues too. Anybody for, who's Indigenous, I've got a huge amount of comments for that. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And of course, the system invariably hasn't supported some careers. So mm. this is a great way to quickly enable a PhD. So I'm thrilled to see you. Queen Kate's in the house. You beat me in, Kate. You beat me in. How are you, gorgeous? Sound. Oh, I don't even get sound. I, no, I can't hear you because you're on mute, you bugger. Sound. 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 Um, Sound you bugger. Um, because I'll need to talk with you because this is the Good model. Morning. I've Good got morning. hello everyone. I freaked out. I th I thought I'd I'd had a real problem there. It's lovely to see you, Kate. Stan, the man's in the house. How are you, Stanley? Good, thank you, Tara. How are you? Oh, mate, it's great to see you. All my favourite people are here. This is great. Oh, Byron, have you not spent enough time with me in the last week? Seriously, you poor man. Hi, Tara. <laughs> Adore ya. So it's fantastic to see you, Byron. Um, kia ora to the wonderful people in the house. Uh, hello, Paul. Great to hello. see you. Oh, and Zineb's in. Hello, Zineb. It's lovely to at least see your beautiful picture. And colleagues, please feel free to, to put your audio on, to put the screen on so we can all meet people. Several relationships will be formed, as always. Crystal's iPhone is here, which is, which is truly frightening. Good morning, Crystal. Do I get a hi? She's connecting to audio. That's fantastic. And Silas, hello. Hello, Silas. Hello. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? Oh, better for hearing your dulcet tones. That's a, that's a way to wake up in Adelaide. That's terrific, mate. And, mate, please feel free to put your video on anytime so we can see your fabulousness. And hello, Kim. Hello, Tara. How are you? Mate, great, great, great to have you on the call. This is brilliant. And I'll, I can see also wonderful Andrew's in. Hello, Andrew. Good morning, Tara. How are you doing? Oh, you've got a fantastic voice. Hello, Andrew. We'll just have to all be, be, be down on the down low with Andrew. And the Queen herself, Fariba's in the house. Oh, we're joining us from surgery once more. Good morning, Fariba. I love you. You know it. She's, she's ignoring me as every student of a supervisor should. So hello, everybody. Look, we'll make a start. <laughs> Thank you for that. Thanks, Byron. I yes. need that laughter. I've, uh, Fariba, I've got you, darling. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. I am again in theatre and I will be in and out if okay. Well, that's, that's fantastic. And I'll make sure I answer your question early. So colleagues, um, I'm thrilled to have so many of you on the call. These were all the questions I got from people around the world. So my feeling is what I'll do. Good morning, Therese. My feeling is what we'll do is we'll, I'll answer like three or four of the ones that I've got. And are then we'll you stop. trying to, to figure out if I'm telling you the truth? Because I am. Oh, you're always telling me the truth, my darling. That's something we both do here. I'm, I'm just Therese Darlin, I think you might be on multiple calls because you're popular. Therese Darlin, look, what but I might... I'm sorry, say, you're asking me for the serial number? I might just... Deli uh, how can I mute? It was always going to happen. Okay. It was always uh, all all I have... So, oh, that's great. So, I've, uh, that was a bit frightening, wasn't it? I was about to find out all sorts of information, Paul, that I didn't know if we needed. So, colleagues, let's commence with an acknowledgement of country, acknowledging the traditional owners of all the lands on which we meet today, elders past and present, and Indigenous colleagues with us today. So, team, welcome to you. This was an idea, this was a vibe, to talk about the PhD by prior publication. Now, this is a very, very special and specialist mode of doctorate that's been very tiny for about 30 years. And all of a sudden, it started to spike in interest. 
So we're getting a lot of queries about it at Flinders University. We've written brand new shiny regulations, policies and procedures to help everybody get through at speed and with clarity. So we thought we'd have a call and I'd look at you all and you can look at me and ask live questions. And in fact, I'll put the chat up as well. And Resh, hello Resh. Resh, good morning. Oh, I'm attending without video and audio. Oh, Resh, that's okay. That's okay, Resh. Good morning, darling one. So let's now talk about this. We've got people that want to supervise this mode of thesis on the call. We've got people looking straight at you, Kate, who are about to enroll in this. We have a student currently under examination, the wonderful Fariba, who has done this model of doctorate. So I thought I'd just start and then answer three quick questions, and then we'll move to all of you to make sure your questions are answered. Good morning, Amy. Good morning, Amy, this is exciting. So colleagues, what is a PhD by prior publication? The PPP has two parts. It has your already existing publications that emerged before you enrol. So when you enrol, you list all the publications that you are going to submit to this mode of thesis, right? And that happens before you enrol. So therefore, you need a certain number of publications, and we'll get to numbers shortly. We need a certain number of publications, but the trick for punters is they must be clustered. So the publications must come together. They must be clustered. They must move us forward. They must demonstrate an original contribution to knowledge. Now, the story of the research is important here. So Byron, probably more than the conventional thesis, we need to have the arc of the publication. So where did your story in this research start? There's an article, it might be historic, it might be 20 years old, and then it arcs into your contemporary originality and you must make the case rather than assume the case. So we've got the publications that form the second half, the bulk of the thesis. But then we have this amazing bit at the start called a contextual statement. That's a pretty well standard phrase around the world, colleagues. And that varies in length between 10,000 words to about 30 or 40,000 words, depending on the mode of the PPP that we're going to be enacting. So there are two clear sections in this mode and the contextual statement must explain the originality of the thesis. What is the original contribution to knowledge? So it tracks the research, explains the research, talks about ethics, yeah. talks about research integrity, and also tracks the research. So Byron, we've talked a lot about this in the last week or so. Here's this great piece of research, but follow the citations, follow its use through the gray literature, follow its research in industry. Right, so you're telling the whole story of yourself as a researcher and also of the research itself. So how's that going? Is that is that okay? Is that reasonably cool? Kate, you're sort of my, because you're about to enrol in this. Kate, are you comfortable with that? Yeah. Does, Rock and um, on. does the contextual statement have to be written prior to enrollment? That's why Kate's here. So the publications must all be published, can be a, a digital preprint colleagues, but they must have a, 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 you know, a, a number, it must be able to have a URL if possible. And so everything's got to be produced, except the contextual statement is written while enrolled. Oh, okay written while enrolled. And so that's where a supervisor, and we might get to this in a second, a supervisor is involved helping you write that contextual statement. And the while Fariba's here and she's scrubbing up, I will quickly answer Fariba's question, which I was going to answer later on Fariba. Fariba wanted a gender question. So why not do that first up? Fariba wanted to know if, you know, the male, female, let alone non-binary trans, let's just do, do the binaries for a moment, um, the role and relationship between men and women enrolled in this. Now, Fariba, in the United Kingdom, and we'll talk about the history of the PPP in a second, in the United Kingdom, the gender split is clear. So it's, it's not a gendered discussion. In Australia, it is a gendered discussion. So if, bizarre, I know, men dominate the PPP because of the disciplines that dominate the PPP in Australia medicine and law. Now, when you've got diverse disciplines like they have in the UK, all the disciplines do the PPP, you don't see a gender variable as being significant. In Australia, you do. So Fariba, I don't know if you can speak, but is that, and of course, so Fariba was our first woman enrolled in the PPP at Flinders University. 
Yeah, that, that's what I heard. And that, I was really surprised and disappointed. Yeah. And for Reba, why do you think it is? Is it just simply women don't know that it exists in Australia or is it a publishing thing that I'm missing out on? No, no, we don't know about it. We are not very research focused. It's all about clinical work. Yes. And one of the medical students told me that I potentially could do it. <laughs> not my head of department, not my, you know, the... Um, uh, um, uh, clinical researcher, and no one, no one from university, just a ordinary medical student. That is just. And sad. I think that is sad. Look, it is sad, and that's why, in some ways, your inspiration for it is currently under examination at the moment. Incredible career, incredible career in surgery, and it's just been a privilege to work with Reba on this oh, thesis. Thank you. And it's currently under examination. But I want her to be a profound role model in this area, as she is in every other area of her oh, life. Thank you. Oh, you're my that. mentor. Thank you. I love you forever. But so, mm -hmm. colleagues, that's interesting for those colleagues in Australia. I don't know uh, for our colleagues in Aotearoa. Zealand. I don't know the Kiwi gender, gender variable in this. I will find it out for us. But Australia, it is heavily male dominated because of the disciplines, not the case in New Zealand. So I'll just do a pause there. Um, any other, yes, I know Resh, uh, Fareeb is amazing. Now, can I'll just do a pause for a second there. Any questions so far? Anything you'd like to discuss? Good morning, Eduardo. Good morning. Oh, good. It's just lovely to see. How are you, mate? It's been ages. Not bad, not bad. Thanks, Tara. Great, great stuff. So um, our wonderful Kiwis were talking about the PPP doesn't exist in Aotearoa, New Zealand. So Hamira Kay, would you like to talk to us about that or Byron? Um, kia ora, Tara. Hey, um, my name's Jumal Pereke. Um, and um, I, this is the model that doesn't exist in New Zealand. And like Fariba, I came across it on a random... Google search. And so that's how I became interested in it. Um, and largely for myself, um, I tried at first to do the thesis route and it didn't really work for me. Coming from an indigenous background, um, the financial strain and all the other stuff, um, all the um, commitments that I had going on to my people and all of that type of stuff, the thesis route wasn't really for me. And so when I found this, um, I started to have conversations with Māori academics that were yes. based at Australian universities. Um, and so that's how I ended up in the space. That's absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. And look, I'm thrilled that's happened. And as we talked about before the call started, mate, I think the Indigenous, the Māori pathway, but the wider Indigenous pathway is important here. And look, I will also just quickly go to costing too. We got a question from the legendary Jackie Hewitt. Jackie asked about coin. So in Australia and New Zealand, if you are a domestic student or indeed you are a New Zealander in the Australian context, you don't pay any fees for the PPP at all, you don't pay fees. Our international colleagues do pay fees, but the key is about the length of this enrolment. A PPP enrolment is between three and six months. So in term, and I know our international colleagues are probably going, are you kidding me? So if you can get all your ducks in a row before you enroll, then by the time you enroll and the clock is ticking and the coin is coming, you're able to manage it financially much, much easier. And that's why our international colleagues, we've got a lot of law and criminology colleagues around the world enrolled in this mode of doctorate. How are we going? Thank you. Thank you, Byron. That's fantastic. Should I just do a little bit? And this is answering Martin's question. Now, Martin's from the UK. Uh, he is, g'day Martin. Um, he's a fantastic professor and he did the PPP. He'd come from journalism and he produced books and obviously thousands of articles and also a fair number of peer reviewed articles. And he did a PPP. And Martin asked me, he's a professor, professor of creative industries at uh, Southampton Solon. And Martin asked me, why is it not considered equal to other PhDs. Now that's interesting coming from a, a full professor that, that did this. So my answer to Martin is 
the UK has a very specific history. They created this PPP and in some ways that earliest uh, originating ideology has continued what's happened to this day, colleagues. So where it was, where it was really forged was for the post-1992 universities. Those of you that know something about the history of English universities, we had polytechnics and universities in the English system. And they made a decision in 1992 to move the polys into the university sector colleagues. And so that movement required the additional credentialing of the PhD. So the PhD was the canary in the mine of quality assurance in the movement towards uh, full university status. And so the CNAA, the Council for National Accreditation of Awards, focused very strongly on the PhD. And the PhD by prior publication emerged for our colleagues in the polytechnic sector who had produced a lot of refereed articles but hadn't had the time to get into a PhD, right? And so a lot of crew from the former polys did the PhD by prior publication, including Martin. And so in the UK, there was, and it is lessening certainly now, but there was that notion that if you did the PPP, that you've come from a poly and a cover of polytechnic. And so the, you know, the hierarchy and elitism and all the rest of it was in play. Can I say the Australian bit of this story is completely different because the PPP is done by people in law <laughs> and people in medicine. So actually it seemed to be an elite mode of doctorate. So it just shows how bizarre all of this is. And of course, colleagues, when you graduate, you graduate with a PhD. You don't have PhD bracket for prior publication, you graduate with a PhD. So I'll do another pause there. How are we going? How are we going? Any further questions, please go for it, Kate. Go for it, Kate, darling, how are you going? Um, I think I wrote this one to you. Yes. Um, I know that you've told me before that any publications that I want to submit have to have signatures of co-authors. Yes. What if co-authors can't or won't sign for example, one of my papers, my co-author died, so I can't get a signature. Um, what if co-authors delay deliberately or yes. they're too busy? What is there a way around that? Look, Kate, there is, and obviously that's one of the questions I'd written, so we'll answer it now. That's brilliant. No, that's great, Kate. I'm very happy. This is great timing. So, colleagues, in terms of those publications that you're clustering together, obviously, if they're single authored, thanks for playing, knock yourself out, boom. Now, what happens if they're not singly authored? Like most of the disciplines in our contemporary university have co-authorship. Now, the important bit of the story is that if you, you really do have to be the first author, if possible. So the first thing is, if you're the second or the third author or the fourth or the 500th and 10th, if we look at some of the research that's coming out at the moment, then, it, then remember you're being assessed for your contribution and your research. So if you're second, third or fourth author, it's harder to make that case, colleagues. So if you're the first author, that's terrific. If you're the second author in the contextual statement, you can put it in, but you need to explain your role. Right. So Kate's then asked, OK, so I've got co-authored publications. And in Kate's case, you are the first author for almost all of them, aren't you, Kate? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, because you're the first author, you, you can use them because they're your article. So it's just like you can cite them. They're on your CV. They are yours, Kate. Now, where the conversation with co-authors gets involved is we will be asking for a research integrity statement. That what that means, Kate, is colleagues that you've written with will have to sign a form that states this is their, you know, you'll have to state, Kate, you know, I have 60% of the role in, in research design, 100% uh, of the role in, in data collection and 80% of the role in writing or whatever that permutation would be. So it's, it's design, it's a data collection analysis and writing and editing, right? Now, it, now, if they don't sign that off, that, that can be a bit challenging, but that's when a dean of graduate research would get involved and in collegial fashion, I would ask them to participate. Uh, that's fine. So that's not a worry and we'll try and leverage something. It might not go wrong, Kate. I think you're a bit pessimistic on that, to be honest. I think it'll be all right. But obviously working with dead people, they, they don't answer too much. You know, they have some challenges with, you know, you don't get a lot of conversation. Uh, trust me, Hector, he's my mate. He doesn't say a lot. Uh, but Kate, darling, 
what happens in those cases? And we do have policy on this at Flinders because uh, our students vary in age from 21 to 93. So we have to be very aware of life and health and death uh, in the life cycle of a PhD. So in the, the death matter, I would get involved in that directly. We look at the other co-authors and negotiate that. But in the case of a death, I would speak with you, get the information, and I would sign that off. Okay. Is that a goer? Yeah. Fantastic. How many do you Right. So, Byron, let's go into numbers. I knew you'd go straight there, Byron. Numbers, numbers, numbers. Um, so let's go into numbers. It varies enormously, colleagues. It really does. But the baseline is six. The base, and I mean really the baseline, because we've got to show enough scope and scale for an examiner to see your work and your research and its value. So six is the absolute baseline, noting that co-authorship is in there. Our Fariba put in 12, and that was a good solid case. That was beautifully done. She was uh, second author on one of them, but number one author on the rest, and the story worked well. One of our great students again in uh, Aotearoa, New Zealand, in Auckland, again, a surgeon, head and neck surgeon, uh, produced 22 articles in the PPP. He was a gentleman in his 70s, the wonderful Randall. He'd had a career of 150 refereed articles, so he picked 22 with a story to tell. So, Byron, you, you've got to get, get the sweet spot right. Pick the number that allows a case to be made. What is the story of the research? What moves you to originality? And do they cluster? So, Byron, when I've seen students and I've had to say, look, go away, write some more articles and come back occasionally when the articles haven't clustered properly, Byron. So, you know, they've, they've throughout their entire career produced 10 articles and think they can just put the 10 in and actually, you know, they're on about four different topics. So that's not going to work. So minimum of six can go up to, I've seen 22 done effectively, but they must cluster. Now, Byron, does that answer your question? Because obviously Byron's got, had two PhDs. Byron, what were your PhDs in terms of mode, mate? Hi Tara, thanks for answering that question. Um, both of the PhDs that I did were just the regular, normal, good old thesis ones. Well done. Yeah. Well done. And you know, I might build on Byron's question and go again to Jackie's other question because Jackie is a full professor. This is Jackie Hewitt. Hello, Jackie, uh, at Griffith University, and she not cheekily actually asked, "I want to do a PPP as a second PhD." And we're, uh, there's Amy. Hello, Amy. D don't tell me you're going to go for a second one, Amy. Are you going to go for, oh, wow. I love you. I love You can do it, Amy. You can do it. So, colleagues, when you're going for a second PhD as a PPP, that's a good idea and it does happen. Where it happens, and again, men have dominated this in Australia so, so far, the PhD was done earlier in their career. I'll use a great example. In maths, say. So, a gentleman did a PhD in maths and then developed a forensic science career out in industry and then was appearing in court. And yet, you know, the, the, the prosecutors were saying and the, and the defence were saying, well, you know, OK, you're here as an expert, but your PhD is in maths, not forensic science. So what he then did was enrol in a PPP. He had these clustered articles in forensic science. He put together, I think it was 15, and that was assessed. So he then had a second PhD, but in forensic science that added credibility to his current role. So let's have a look. So is that is that helping a bit? So for Jackie, Jackie, if she she's done some amazing work. She had a long, fantastic career, highly published. But Jackie's moving into uh, exploring Islamophobia and journalism. And that's very, very different from her original PhD. And she's getting a lot of consultancy in that area. So I think Jack's probably thinking, I've got enough books and articles to create that second PhD on Islamophobia and the media. And that will perhaps add a bit of traction to her consultancy. Now, is, is that helping? What do you think, Amy? So Amy Darlin, obviously you're not gonna do a second one for a while, you've just said, but but what would be your motivation, my queen? Um, well, I know that I want to stay research active and I know that I've shifted out of science and science education to um, working in libraries now. And so I'm like, well, it's a different discipline and because I wanna stay research active, why not think about this as something I might do. Um, so just kind of getting the details of how many articles, how you pull it together, and then thinking about whether that's something I will do. But I was like, if you can do it by prior publication, why not? 
And so, Amy, darling, what that will involve is you, and you've heard me say this a lot, for the PPP, you've got to get your ducks in a row. And I hate yeah. using the cliche, but that's the best descriptor I can use. So it's all front loaded. So you've got to do all the work before you enroll. So, Amy, if you're heading for that, you go in the next three years, I'm going to write 10 articles about information literacy, science education and librarianship. Yeah. And they are clustered because you, you're looking at them yeah. to create them for that reason, right? Yeah, and that's what I thought. It's a good way to think about this now so I can plan it out properly. And I'm still figuring out what space in libraries I want to land in. So I'm thinking <laughs> academic libraries, but you never know. Look, that's right. And it would be of great use to you because a librarian, little one with one, but with two, two PhDs, uh, game over, girlfriend, you end up yeah. ahead of a library that you choose to be head of. Yeah, and the literature space is quite messy. Um, so it kind of needs some direction brought to it. And I thought, well, I've done this before. I could have a go. Yes, absolutely. And look, Amy, I'll use your expertise because our wonderful colleagues in New Zealand are again talking about journal ranking. And there were great questions in my pile about that. So I'll go straight there now, team. So obviously in some disciplines, the, the ranking is, is a proxy like all proxies and an elegant proxy for inverted commas quality. Now in the, and of course in a lot of disciplines, we don't care at all. So in the PPP, the ranking of journals and so forth is not in our regs, is not in our regs. <laughs> um, and of course, speaking again, we're doing a lot of conversation about Maori and indigenous research. As we all know, colleagues, indigenous researchers are treated disgracefully in the Smargo journal rankings. Uh, so if you want to publish in an Indigenous, let alone Māori tanga, uh, Māori journals, um, they're not treated properly by Elsevier at all. So if you're, with the greatest respect, and, and so if you're wanting to, to publish for community impact, you're publishing in journals that are not respected by corporate academic publishers, right? And there's thousands of disciplines like that. So for me, the, the key is, cluster the publications together. They have to have gone through refereeing, although we may talk about non-traditional research objects, Nitro shortly, but they've got to go through refereeing. But if you can make the case, so Byron, if you think about open access journals, right? If you made the case, it may not be in the top of, of the tier of ranking, but if you've got citations coming from those journal articles, and what I'm interested in, the best PPP colleagues, take that article and in the contextual statement, show the journey of the article, show where it's been used in grey literature, show where it's been used in community, show where it's been used beautiful forever, show how it's been used in trans community. So she's doing minimally invasive surgery and so forth. And she does a lot of work with the trans community. So, you know, that, that may not have high citations, but the use of that research in community is crucial. So, the, the tier and the ranking does not matter really at all in our policy and procedure, but you've got to make the case for originality and how the research has travelled. Brilliant. Now, Stanley, hello, Stanley. Lovely to see you, mate. Now, what have we got here? What's your question, mate? Yeah, my question is, in regards to people who have published, maybe they could be journalists or people who write books yes. and, and such, and they want to use maybe the uh, published books to to uh, get a PhD by prior publication, how would that sit in form of either an exegesis or the normal just PhD? Books are living the dream, Stanley. They're living the dream. They are the easiest PPPs to do, as my wonderful colleague Martin confirmed. So, Stanley, if you've got books, so if people have come to um, the PPP with books, they are submitted. The whole book is submitted, and I have seen great PPPs done, again, not here because of the disciplines that dominate at the moment, but in the UK, where the book is the central spine of the publication submitted, and articles exist around it to show the story of the book. Right. So these articles appeared, this book appeared, these articles came out of it. Right. So the book is the no brainer PPP. It's a brilliant PPP. And because the the number of objects, research objects, articles, books and so forth are not specified and the length is not specified, um, people can submit books and it makes an outstanding case. Oh, tell me. Tell me about the Charles Sturt 
university one? Because I, you know, I used to work at Bathurst, mate. So tell me about the architecture one. Yeah, no, so there's a humanities architecture based PPP solely on um, architecture in Bathurst, which is based on a book. Look, it is, and I think I know exactly the person you're talking about, and I know the book. So that's a great idea. Can I say the other thing leading into architecture, mate, design can also be a part of this. So people that have design-led research, the designs can be part of the PPP object as well. How are we going? Yes, Amy, that could work really well for you. So I'll quickly move through a couple more questions if I can while people are thinking and keep, keep asking me. Michelle... Oh, this is, I'm going to be honest here, and I might upset people, so I apologise in advance, but I'm going to tell the truth. <laughs> Thanks, Byron. Support me, brother. I need your help. Michelle, why are some disciplines against the PPP? Okay. Now, let's do this. And Stanley, you can speak at any time on this from your personal experience too. But as we all know, many disciplines rely on PhD students to uh, do the research and write the articles that are co-authored with their supervisors. I'm going there. I'm going there, mate. I'm going there. So, so, <laughs> preach. So, so, Tim, what happens is, of course, in many disciplines, uh, and I can say including physics, so I'm speaking of my own husband here, uh, that you've got, you, you, you know, you, you have the grant and you're involved in the design, probably it is your project, but the student produces the research and writes the article and then the supervisor's name is on that article, okay? Now, needless to say, colleagues who gain from that particular mode of doing research, which is about half our university, half our disciplines, are not a big fan of the PPP because they don't get their name on publications. Oh, I've just had a moment with Kate. Kate and I have just had a moment. So, so when people go, I, I, I have no support for the PPP at all. If you look at those disciplines, you can sort of understand why. And look, at this point, I might just talk about the PhD by publication too, and how radically different these are. Obviously, the people that are very against the, the PhD by prior publication are big fans of the PhD by publication for obvious reasons. And look, I'll just tell the story. We're talking about Charles Sturt University. I used to be head of school there. And one of my great colleagues in early childhood education, had done a PhD by publication and she produced four, four articles during three years co-written with her supervisors. And I was doing her annual performance management. She just finished this PhD with four articles and she started to cry. I won't get upset, but she, she's a lovely woman, love Helen. Started to cry. I said, darling, what is going on? She said, I've just spent the last three years, my family have sacrificed everything to get this PhD with four articles and I'm not even research active by the definition of this university. Whereas if you produce a PhD of size, you can get a lot of articles out of it. So I'll use my example, my PhD, I got 13 articles out of, out of that PhD because it was big. It was big. Now, Amy, we're, we're yet to go through your thesis. You had a big thesis. How many articles are we going to get out of yours, darling? Um, I'm still toying with that. So we made a list. I got to 12 quite easily. I think I'm scaling back to six purely because I'm ready to move on to a new space. Um, so I'm like, what can I co-author? What can I get out? And then, then I can single author from now on. It's spot on. So you can see what's happening, colleagues. If you do the PhD by publication, you, you truncate it because people have three articles and I've been in these conversations. If you get three articles, that's enough for a PhD. But three articles is what we do before we get up in the morning, to be frank. I mean, By Byron does three articles a week. It's unbelievable. I mean, By Byron, how many articles have you produced in the last 12 months? It's, it's stunning, Byron. You know, the idea that four, I mean, can you imagine four articles in three years, Byron? Unbelievable. So does that make a bit of sense why some disciplines go, I'm really not interested in this? Um, Eduardo, I might just crunch to you for a second. How are you going, mate? Oh, very well, thank you. I mean, you can disagree because you are a, a scholar and a gentleman uh, and produce fantastic and outstanding research. Well, I'm a scholar anyway. I don't know about gentlemen. Oh, but, I uh... do. I do. But where are you on this one, mate? How are you feeling? Yeah, about this yeah, yeah. Well, look... Um... Not to make it too parochial, but it was one of your colleagues, Jerry Redman, who first um, threw this as a possibility to me. Um, 
I suppose the word that uh, stands out for me is um, uh, the reason why my, my books behind me are color-coded rather than discipline-coded is because I, I don't like silos. And I realized it was actually depressing me to try and kind of work out, you know, which, which books were sociology and which books were urban planning. So part of uh, where I'm coming from is I suppose that when I did my initial doctorate back in the early to mid nineties, it was still very, you know, discipline based. You, 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 you have a, a, co a research code, uh, blah, 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 blah. But the other one is also that um, increasingly I like hanging out with um, local creative entrepreneurs and people like placemakers. So the other silo that I kind of um, want to get around, I think also is university versus, I don't know, industry or community. So, yes. uh, so really, um, yeah, how does the PPP sit if you want to get away from silos? Uh, uh, and it's the dream and that's the other point and no one asked that question Eduardo which is why you were in my life can I say I had the privilege of being in an edited uh, edit collection that Eduardo edited and it was a privilege and an incredibly professional experience so Eduardo is an absolute legend in place and sense making phenomenal in terms of city imaging you are the man so Eduardo you've picked out the crucial point if you are anti-disciplinary interdisciplinary post-disciplinary multidisciplinary, and silos have said you publish in these journals and do it in this way then the ppp is the way forward yeah, okay. because as long as you've got examiners as long as you can find examiners in the flinders system yeah. somewhere in the world as long as you can find examiners you can submit that radical interdisciplinary radical anti-disciplinary and as you've said Eduardo if you're doing city imaging like you and I do then it's about I've written this research and how does that model travel and enable real life policy procedural change, right? And so you do that work brilliantly. So the PPP allows you, here is this article. Now, who, what councils have used this, right? What leisure-based organizations, what sporting community organizations have used it? And that again, um, shows impact and engagement. So all sorts of different ways of thinking about importance emerge in this mode of doctorate because you've got the space in the contextual statement to make your case on your terms. Eduardo, I'm just... Go, go, Eduardo, then we'll go to Amy. No, go, no, Eduardo. just one, 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 one kind of follow-up. Um, yeah, I, I suppose that, like, if you were going to do, in the traditional PhD, if you're going to do an industry-related one, you know, all the eggs that would have to be lined up or the ducks that would have to be lined up is that, you know, your supervisor may have got a, a, a you know, a linkage grant. Uh, there are agreements with the industry partners, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, just say you you, you do want to do something creative or design-led or whatever with, with industry. Yes. Uh, what kind of ducks or eggs do you have to line up for yes. the CPP? Yes, so the first gift is just watch and monitor IP because often in industry... Uh, topics and research areas within a PhD or within a university, as you know, as well as I do, there's often the IP is signed away by students. Yeah. So if, if you're free, if you're free falling, um, to quote uh, the great Tom Petty, uh, then what you need to do is just be very, very clear about IP. So make sure in your industry work that there may be, you know, consultancy documents that you write and so forth. And you're very clear on that IP. And you're also then very clear about this is your research. So it's got to be, I would argue, Eduardo, really, really clear at the start. So everything about everything clear. And then just the second variable in some disciplines to watch outside of a university oh, is the matter of ethics is the matter of ethics, okay? So just, just make yeah. sure that all the ethics areas are aligned or, you know, if you're using unobtrusive research methods for the article that doesn't require ethical variables, then all that's good too. So just watch ethics and watch IP. And if those two variables are organized, we're winning. You're a rock star. Now, Amy, what were you gonna to say to Eduardo? I don't wanna get between you I two. have a new point now as well, but um, I'll come back to that. So Eduardo, you mentioned um, you're interested in academic spaces and design. There's some really interesting library literature on library spaces and how they're being reconfigured as collections get smaller. Um, and so now it's considered a real social space. So there's great literature there for you to dive into to help you think around that space. 
Um, what's related to that and got me thinking about Tara's point just now, depending on what your research focus is, whether it's about design elements or those design elements in use. So how is the space being used by people? And you could, you could focus on that aspect if that helps you get over some of the IP design hurdles. Look, that's a nice one too, isn't it? And of course, GLAMS as well, Eduardo. I mean, Eduardo yeah, does yeah. incredible work on GLAMS. And you know, I think you know, mm. GLAMS is going to be incredibly important to city imaging in the future. And that's very important on stakeholder engagement too. So that's absolutely right. Can I just go to the wonderful Paul to make sure Paul's well? You've been lovely as part of this conversation, Paul. Are you getting some of the answers that you need to these questions? What, what's your vibe before I move to my next pile? Oh, thank you. Um, I actually, I'm doing my PhD by prior publication at the moment, uh, which I'm really enjoying. I have to say it, it's, it's just an amazing opportunity to reflect back on my papers. Yes. Um, you mentioned earlier in the talk that uh, the uh, it's three to six months. And I was actually told right from the beginning that it's full time at, um, at 12 months. And, and that's through Flinders. So I, I just, it's a I'm curious about if you could explain that. A little Look, bit. I, I can, Paul, and this is my argument about having all the ducks in a row before you start and alignment. So we certainly have in the policy, it can be up to 12 months. Absolutely. You could do it, part, you do whatever you like. Um, but I'm very conscious that the overwhelming majority of PPPs we have are way under six months. Oh, way, under, okay. way under six months. So Fariba, I think, is still in surgery. How exciting is it to have someone in surgery? Fariba took, uh, she was ready to rumble at, at three months, certainly, probably. Don't tell her this. She probably, hello, Fariba. She probably would have at two and a half months gone through, but but just supervisor was pretty hard on you, Fariba, <laughs> and, and kept you going a little bit longer. But yeah, Paul, it's one of those things. How long is a piece of string? If you have all your ducks in a row at the point of enrollment, and you write the contextual statement, you've got a great supervisor that know what's going on with writing that statement. This this thing can be really, really quick. But, you know, so does that help a bit, Paul? That makes me feel a lot more reassured. <laughs> I had another question. Is it possible to ask you now? Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, so one of the things that I'm struggling a bit with is that uh, I'm writing about, my papers are about healthcare. And so obviously healthcare has has evolved you know in the time that i've written the uh papers at, like the pbs you know new drugs get added or taken off or whatever yes. and and so it provided just an amazing opportunity to actually reflect on the growth of the um the healthcare system that i'm talking about um but i, I just I, i'm struggling to talk about time in the the um journey in in terms of uh how, how do you like, list all of the changes that have happened in healthcare that are independent to the papers, but are connected, if that makes sense? Are contextually Just, relevant. Look, absolutely, yeah. absolutely, Paul. So in some ways, the contextual statement, I mean, it is the most important part, to be honest with you. It's the, it's the pass or fail, really. And it's about getting that mix right. That's why some go very long, Paul, but it's about the story of the research and, in fact, the story of you as a researcher. What makes this a, a really evocative mode of doing a PhD and quite different is that it aligns the researcher and the research. So, Paul, it's almost useful to do that sort of statement of position, which is increasing in a lot of theses at the moment. So, so what brought you to this research and what changes have you seen through your career? We have a lot of colleagues, obviously, you're incredibly and possibly young, Paul, but we have colleagues that are coming to this in their 40s and 50s and 60s, in the case of Randall, 70s, with an outside standing career so in some ways it's almost a career review so it's finding that pathway through that history because obviously you know there's a huge history you could tell all histories have 57 <laughs> histories within them so you've got to pick carefully sketch out the arc that enables you to confirm the original contribution to knowledge of the thesis so the history that you select is the one that allows you to, to foreshadow, to bring forward your originality. And the, anything that doesn't, you know, is a, is a secondary matter, can go in footnotes, can go in an appendix at the end, but it's about you, that research, and confirming originality. So configure the history that allows that connection to be made. Okay. 
Yep, I'm, I'm hearing you. Yeah, so there, there could be a whole lot of things that could be included, but actually they are almost red herrings. Like the, the focus is, yeah, the, what I have contributed. Spot on. And if, if it helps, Paul, I mean, obviously you're a brilliant, brilliant man, but the issue is always think about it from the examiner's perspective, you know, because the people in the PPP, you are outstanding professionals. You've already got an outstanding career. We know that. We don't need to teach you methodology. We don't need to do the research training. You've got it. You got it, girlfriend. You got it, right? So, therefore, what we need to do is make sure that that contextual statement explains to the examiner the original contribution to knowledge. So, think about it, Paul, from the examiner's perspective. They've read your articles. Go, this this person is a good researcher. We know that. There's eight articles here. So, peer review, good researcher. That's not in question. The question is the arc between them and the originality and the contextual statement has to nail that down for the examiner. Perfect. Thank you. Oh, you're, you're a rock star. Um, how's the admissions? Oh, so, so Stanley, ask me the question again, darling. Where are we admissions? Go for it, darling. Yes. Uh, from my experience, I've been an intern I did my PhD as an international student. You did? And so post finishing, I've been having all these people that I've been representing, they've not been able to attend here, but one of the questions that has been coming up is what admission requirements would there be? Would they be the same standard requirements into a normal PhD or what sort of requirements would be there? Well, Stanley, it is interesting. It is obviously there are always standard requirements, but in the case of the PPP, and you've heard me say this thousands of times, mate, um, a, a recognition of standards does not require standardization. So if someone is coming into the PPP process and you have 10 refereed articles, right? And can I give an example of this? I signed one off this week. So 10 refereed articles, and in this case, in English, right? In English. So this person then, and then somebody in one of the areas of the university said, but do they need to do an English language test to prove their English language ability? And I, I understand that because I just said, mate, They've written 10 refereed articles in English. I'm comfortable with that proxy. Yeah, and through. So you see what I'm sort of saying? So, okay, there's yeah. this benchmark to get into the thesis. But in many ways, you've already done the research. So many of the ticker box things that we would go through have already been achieved, right? So we okay. take every PPP on a case-by-case -case basis. You remember the, the lovely Sally uh, Stanley. So Sally, our head of admissions, she, you know, very senior professional staff member, she personally handles each individual PPP. And we have a PPP meeting every week, Sally and I, where I look at each individual case and I read the publications. So this is very much a bespoke way of, of doing this thesis. And yes, there are, you know, standard ways in, but in each case, these are very different theses. Does that help? Yes, it does. Certainly. Thank you. Fantastic. Oh, and, oh, and Tony's, Tony's found a new friend. Hi, Tony. Do you want to just talk Hi. to me, Alan? Obviously, everyone's much more interested in Eduardo because I'm much more interested in Eduardo too. But Tony, how are you going? I'm good, thank you. I've um, completed my PhD, but now I'm trying to draw um, uh, papers and a book out of that, out of the, um, out of the uh, thesis, right. and doing a lot of that kind of on my own. So that's why I'm here, just to pick up some more ideas on how to progress that, because I was never uh, encouraged to do any publication while doing the PhD. Wow. And Tony, if it helps you, obviously I'm happy to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with you, but some colleagues may remember, I think Amy might've been on this call too. We did a call about two months ago on yes. disseminating the doctorate and we yes. really hammered everything out. So here is this big chunk of text. Where can this text go? Yeah, yeah. And I, I missed that, unfortunately. So that's why I thought I'd just pick up a thing, but there's, I, I'd really like to discuss one of my findings about a space in Brisbane that... Um, I've identified the relationship, the, how it's been, it's kind of the reconstructing of an Aboriginal mission, but in a new form. Ooh. And the way that um, a park has been set up next, well, this, the park's been there, but then the Department of Child Safety has set up a building that overlooks the park. So I'd really like to be able to discuss that with somebody who knows about spatial politics and design and stuff. 
you you have found the right person on the right call eduardo that he is amazing on that research so eduardo sorry i've dobbed you in there mate but you know how famous you are <laughs> looking at you i, I, I love uh, having coffees with people virtual or otherwise it'd be virtual uh, probably unless you're on the gold coast or brisbane <laughs> i wish we all were on the gold hey, coast I, I, i've got a brother who lives on the gold coast he's just yeah. there for love so you never know oh, there you go. that is fantastic look my my intention you know for this month has been basically to try and buy byron a cup of coffee i every time i have a cup of coffee byron i'm like oh byron what you know poor byron so you've had a bad effect on me byron so i'll buy you a cup of coffee on the gold coast right so let's just go through a few more questions if we can so natalie's asked me about originality so again this builds in with the wonderful conversation we've had already paul the publications must build into originality so it can start with historic material so you know a lot of people start with articles from 20 years ago or 30 years ago or 40 years ago kate so they start with these really historic um, you know, they were there at the start and obviously then people have built on that work and they've lost the originality, but then it comes back with the modern one. So that's the story to tell. And I always describe the contextual statement like a jigsaw. So you've got to put the pieces together to make sure that the story is sound. Now, what did we say? Now, Carolyn, Carolyn asked me, hi, Carolyn, how do, how do we create the story? How do we create the story of the research? So I thought I'd just give you some basic headings that might make it very easy for you. So, you know, it's got to be smooth and beautiful, but at its most basic, the contextual statement has, how was this research created? Why was it created? And link in some ways the research to the problem that you have solved. And it may be an intellectual problem. It may be a community problem. It may be a health problem. What problem are you solving? then have some material on ethics, then have some strong material on citations. Again, if you can track where your research has gone, that's the beautiful bit of the contextual statement there. And then try and talk about the use of the research and how people have used it. So how's that going? Is that a go? -er? Any other questions? Or we're still I'm just going to plug libraries there. If you're stuck Please. with your metrics, go talk to your librarians. They can help you with that. They, look, they certainly can. And Amy, obviously, I've just been using Google Scholar. But I tell you what, a lot of other colleagues, we've got a lot of senior colleagues on this call. It is amazing when you actually see, when you look at the citations, how your research has been used. Drill into the citations rather than just dealing with it as a number, and you'll be stunned at that. So let's just go to EWA if I can, last few minutes, but please interrupt me if I'm not covering the questions you want. Let's do a few more. EWA, how many articles? So she asked the how many. Baseline six, but that is the risky baseline. So if you can get above six, that's great. Remember that the number you pick has to render it equivalent in standard to the traditional PhD. And Caroline asked me about how to manage the age of publications that we've just talked about. Now, this is an important one. Caroline also asked about, here we go, the editing of the papers. Now, no one's asked that question yet. And the reason being that the papers can't be edited because the because it's PhD by prior publication, they have to appear as they did originally. Okay, but that's not necessarily a problem if, as we've all published, you know, Paul, I don't know about you, but if you look back on some of your historic research, you go, oh, I was probably wrong there. I was probably a bit wrong. Or, or, you know, or it went okay, but, but gee, I should have really nailed that point. The, the weaknesses and the, the changes that you would make now to those articles, that's part of the story. So they have to appear as they originally did, but don't be embarrassed about that. Have that historic trajectory in place. So as I've described in my own card, Paul, make sure if you found stuff in your original articles, you talk about the updates, you talk about the changes, you talk about the debates that have recontextualized your research through time. What do you think? What do you think, Paul? Yeah, that's good. Uh, when you listed that sort of structure, that really resonated with me. Have you, I mean, obviously you you just uh, set it off from your head, but is there a structure sort of um, written down somewhere that- look, look, Paul, I haven't. Obviously I was just prepping this t today. Yeah. I I've done it, as you know, because I mean, that's how we first met really. But as you know, I did that, that vlog on it, but I'll tell you what, I've never yeah. actually written, I don't want to sort of do it like paint by numbers. I understand. But in, oh, yeah, but yeah. No, but in some ways I've never thought about it before, Paul. I might just write, 
a one pager on these are some headings to consider. Yeah. These are some headings to consider. And obviously, as we often talk about, and Stanley, you remember this, this is my advice to you, that when you start writing, you have 57 headings. Yeah. <laughs> and then as the writing comes good, the headings start to remove. So look, I'll get onto that, Paul. That's a, that's a really good idea. Uh, yeah. Right. So yeah. let's, oh, I think we've done that for Sue. So Sue's asked about papers published with established authors. So I think, Kate, we've handled that one. And author order is crucial. So I don't have Kate where our Kate still is. Kate, and for most of yours, you were first author. I think you're, you're getting oh, your ducks wow. in a row now. Yeah. To get a couple more through, Kate, aren't you? So, how many are you? How many articles are you thinking of publishing going forward with this, Kate? That was going to be another question. I've got two that I've submitted for publication. Not sure. Haven't heard back yet. But my my question is, I've got three master's degrees. You know, clinical nursing, law, and public health. But in those theses, I've got masses of stuff that I could pluck out to submit for another publication. How far back can I go? So my first thesis was 1996. Yes. Now, now this is where it gets complicated. So I'm glad we've gone to the really nightmarish case to finish this off, Kate, to really get my brain focused for the day. So look, as I've said, the date and the legacy content, that doesn't matter. The refereeing matters, the clustering, the story that you tell matters. The challenge we've got, and this is also for colleagues thinking of doing a second PhD, is that if you've already submitted the work to a previous degree, it can't be resubmitted for a new one because you sign a declaration at the start of every PhD, this work has not been submitted for another degree. So if you're doing a, a second PhD like the wonderful Byron does, then you've got to go, well, this is that PhD with this cluster of publications. Now, gap, what is the separation to this set? So, Kate, that's the challenge you've got is if you can find a way to use the research in a new way, so say a Turnitin wouldn't pick up the relationship, so you take the idea, but you do something new with it, that's cool. Okay. But if, you, if, if the relationship is too close, you've already submitted it. Does that help a little bit? That's great. Yeah, but it's, it's, cha it's challenging, I know. That's, yeah. That is challenging. So let's have a look. Amy Authorships, I think we've done that. Yes, that's good. Now, any other questions as I'm, I'm hurtling through our final lot? Byron, straight in. Byron, talk to me. Um, hi, Tara. Does the PPP have a, an oral exam? No. Yes, good. <laughs> No, we're not as uh, we're not as advanced as Aotearoa New Zealand, and I know that'll come as a surprise to you, Byron. Um, most universities in Australia still do not have an oral exam. About a quarter of our universities do, uh, but the nature of the PPP <coughs> is that that uh, it, it it really can't. Mm -hmm. The question you'd be asking of colleagues, you know, it's already gone through refereeing, ethics approval, ethics clearance, and so forth. So yes, there is there is it is simply here is the document. It goes through examination. You get a result. Thanks for playing. Am I going to convince you to do a third one, Emma Byron? Yeah, quite possibly, Tara. Um, but while we've while you've been talking, um, I sent off, you know, some of my notes to a, a dear colleague of mine who's written extensively um, on on um, the revitalization of Te Reo Māori and other things. Mm -hmm. He's written academic articles, some. Um, and he's he's written a number of books as well, but he wasn't interested in a PhD. So I'm like, hey, you need to go and talk to Flinders. Yeah, you do because he needs a PhD. He kind of needs that PhD if he's going to move anywhere. Spot on, Byron. And if you remember that history where we started when I was answering Martin's question, it started for our outstanding colleagues in the polytechnic sector who needed the accreditation. Right? They were great scholars who hadn't had the opportunity to take the time, have the research life, research career. They've been teaching heavily. And so this was an opportunity to accredit them. And if you think about the Fariba case as well, an outstanding human being, outstanding researcher, who, you know, a great clinician, I mean, she's in surgery now, and never had the opportunity to spend three years of her life doing this research in this way. And the PPP provided the answer. Fantastic. Now I could keep going with the questions. One minute left. 
colleagues, are there any other questions you'd, you'd ask me? I'd love to hear from you. And it's great to see Sunil. Sunil, my beautiful, beautiful friend. Sunil, can I just say hi to you, darling? Hi, Tara. Wow, it's early for you. So Sunil's come in from, from Perth. Uh, you are an absolute legend. Hello, everyone. Um, so, so Sunil, don't tell me you're thinking of doing another Tara. PhD. Yes, I'm thinking of doing another one, writing a novel <laughs> under your supervision. You got a deal. <laughs> I'd enroll you yesterday. Let's do that. So, Sunil, are you thinking a, a creative led project? Yes, I'm thinking of, I have really published, partially published a novel online in one of the key uh, newspapers, it's one of the oldest in Asia. Yes. And I haven't completed it because the editor really gave me up due to some politics. Anyway, I'll approach you because I'm really homebound in Perth. <laughs> and you, I am so excited. So I'll just finish off with the final conversation. Sunil, can I say, is a great mate. I've known Sunil for 25 years. And Sunil has this fantastic policy career, but also is one of the great poets and writers in the country, I would argue. And so Sunil has shown you can also have the non-traditional research objects that are often called nitros in Australia, colleagues. That phrase doesn't move internationally at this point. But if you've got these objects with research in them, and particularly for the creative-led areas, they can be submitted in the place of articles in the book, and the contextual statement can confirm the research in it. Does that help, Sunil? Yes, of course. I do want Fantastic. Just so, and it's so early in Perth, darling. Thank you for being a part of it. So look, colleagues, I'm conscious you've had to put up with me for one hour. Can I, I thank all our friends that have joined us right around the world for this session. Uh, you are all incredibly precious. And the, what I'd say is the people I've met through the PPP, which the amazing Fariba is, is the archetype. Um, these outstanding people being given an opportunity to, to, codify how great they are is just tremendous. And that's yeah. the journey of the PPP. The people that would not have had three years have an opportunity to get a PhD. So Fariba, this one's for you, my darling. Love you. Thank you. Love you. Love you. And colleagues, thank you so much for your time. Uh, have a lovely rest of the day. Have a lovely night's sleep, those of you that have joined us from Europe and North America. Take care, colleagues. See you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Fantastic. Wonderful. One.